There's reusable, reclosable bags that say for freezer on them. Those work really well. It's a thicker plastic than the storage type bags. There's a lot of containers like square containers, rectangular containers that are plastic with lids on them. And those are designed to be used for freezing. Start with the right type of packaging and you'll end up with a better quality product. It'll help make it last longer in the freezer. Most things can last maybe 8 to 12 months in the freezer, but if you're not using the right type of packaging, it cracks. The other thing that could happen is freezer burn. Freezer burn, it's going to reduce the quality of it. It's because air is getting inside the package and it dries it out. As home gardeners continue to bring in this year's harvest, a Kansas State University food scientist says that when you run out of friends and neighbors faster than fruits and vegetables, it's time to think about food preservation. And she says that freezing is one of the most effective methods. However, how it is done will affect the quality of the final product. On today's Sound Living, the science of freezing food. Sound Living is a weekly public affairs program produced by Research and Extension at Kansas State University. I'm Jeff Wickman. After harvesting fruits and vegetables, Karen Blakesley, who is also the coordinator of the university's Rapid Response Center, says that chemical changes still occur because of enzymes naturally within the food. Karen, we've had an opportunity in the past to talk a lot about canning and food preservation, and part of that is freezing food as well, and that's what we want to cover today because there are a number of different topics within freezing food. First of all, let's make sure that people understand this is a science when it comes to freezing food. Oh, absolutely. It's a pretty easy process to do, but there is some science that is involved with it, and part of it has to do with prepping the food properly so that it survives the freezing process as best as it can. And then during freezing itself, the food has a lot of water in it. You know, every food has some level of water in it. And so when freezing occurs, the water inside that food expands, and then it will break the cell structure within that food. And then when you go to thaw out the food, you see this water coming out of the food. That's what that's coming from mainly. So, you know, how cold your freezer is also plays a role in that. How much food you're putting in at a time plays a role. So there is a lot of factors to it. So knowing the steps and knowing the recommended methods to prep the food and getting it into the freezer properly can really help the quality in the end. In terms of vegetables, I've heard the term blanching quite a bit. Is that really where we start? Yeah, exactly. So, for example, we're really into corn season right now. Sweet corn is really popping off the stalks. And so blanching vegetables is really important because it really helps protect the flavor, the color, the texture, and the overall quality of the food during the freezing process. What that does is it stops the enzymes that are within the food from doing their work. Those enzymes are naturally a part of the food, but even after you've picked that corn off the stalk, those enzymes are still going to keep working. Changes happen, and they can change the color, texture, flavor, overall quality. But what blanching does is the heat helps inactivate those enzymes, and so that stops them from making any more changes during the freezing process, and then you'll end up with a better quality product in the end. So that's not boiling though, right? Well, it is a quick boil. Every vegetable has its own time as far as how long you blanch it. I myself just did some corn the other day, and you blanch the cobs of corn for four minutes. Take them out of the boiling water, immediately put them into ice water, and that stops the cooking process. So corn is four minutes. Some things are only one to two minutes. It's a boiling water. There are some vegetables that you could steam blanch, which is essentially putting the food like zucchini, for example, in a uh, colander over the boiling water so it's not sitting in the water itself. And so that steam helps blanch the zucchini that way. And then it's only like a quick one or two minutes for that. Take it out, put it in the cold water so it chills really fast, drain it, and then you can proceed with freezing it. I've also heard the term flash freezing. So is this similar? Flash freezing is really getting it into the freezer itself and how cold it is and how much air circulation is in your freezer. A lot of home freezers don't have a fan in them to circulate the air. Commercial freezers, those are blast chillers, and they have 
big fans in them that will help circulate that cold air, which will really freeze the food really fast. We recommend that your home freezers be at least at zero degrees Fahrenheit or colder. The colder it is, the faster it's going to freeze, and that helps protect the quality in the end. The other thing to remember is to not overload your freezer with a bunch of warm food or room temperature food, essentially, by the time you get it ready to put in the freezer. So do it in small batches so your freezer can keep up. And when you put the packages of food in the freezer, try to space them apart so that the air, what air is in there can circulate around the packages, and that'll help freeze them faster, too. In terms of fruit, what can we do? I'm assuming that not all fruit is maybe suitable for freezing. There's a lot of them that can be. Berries are really easy. You just basically wash them, clean the debris off, look for any damage or anything like that, and pick that out. Drain them on some paper towels, and then spread them out on a cookie sheet and let them freeze that way first. And then take them out of the freezer and put them in whatever freezer packaging you're going to use. And that helps keep the berries separate. If you put them all in when they're still in their fresh form put them all in the package, you're going to end up with a big rock. (laughs) And that's not very easy to eat. So the tray freezing helps give you more individual berries and you can portion them out as you use them and not have to use the whole package at once. Peaches are one that if you leave them set out in the open, you know, with air, you'll see the color change happen. They'll start to turn brown. Again, that goes back to what I was talking about with the enzymes in the vegetables. Enzymes are in fruit too, and those enzymes are causing that color change with the reaction with the oxygen in the air. So that color change happens. So what you need to do with like peaches and apples and pears, those are all susceptible to color change, is use like lemon juice or ascorbic acid, which is vitamin C. There's ascorbic acid mixtures. There is a brand name called Fruit Fresh that's out there. A lot of people are familiar with that. That works really well, and adding that acid to that fruit helps stop that browning reaction. Some fruits need to have some sugar added to them. That also helps protect the texture of them and helps protect the color, like peaches, for example. But even those, if you wanted to, you could freeze those without sugar. Its quality is probably not going to come out very good in the end because sugar does help protect the texture of them. So every fruit is a little bit different uh, as far as how you handle that. You know, if you put sugar on them, then usually you do just put them in a package and go ahead and freeze them, you know, like in a quart size package or something like that. And that's the other thing, you know, as you're freezing, you can portion things out as to how you think you might use them. Say you want to make a pie out of those peaches. Well, you probably have a pretty good idea of how much peaches you need to use to make a pie. So you can put that whole quantity in a package and then you're ready to use it. Kind of plan ahead on that so you can have things ready to go when you're ready to use them. You mentioned packaging a number of times, so what kind of packaging do we need? There is a lot of types of plastic out there, but not every plastic is meant to be used as a freezer container. I know it can be frugal to reuse plastic containers that we buy other foods in, such as cottage cheese or something like that. That type of plastic is not meant to be used in a freezer. It's not what it's built for, not what it's designed for. And oftentimes, you know, when you put food in the freezer, it's going to expand because of that water that's in that food. Well, oftentimes you'll see those containers crack. So it's best not to use those. There are a lot of freezer, what we call freezer safe plastic packaging out there. There's reusable, reclosable bags, plastic bags that say for freezer on them. Those work really well. It's a thicker plastic than the storage type bags. If you feel them, you'll feel the difference. The storage bags are a lot thinner. There's a lot of containers like square containers, rectangular containers that are plastic with lids on them, and those are designed to be used for freezing. And what's nice about those is they're stackable, and so they can fit into corners of your freezer a lot more efficiently. Start with the right type of packaging and you'll end up with a better quality product. It'll help make it last longer in the freezer. You know, most things can last maybe 8 to 12 months in the freezer, but if you're not using the right type of packaging, it cracks. The other thing that could happen is freezer burn. 
freezer burn, it's going to reduce the quality of it is because air is getting inside the package and it dries it out. Start with the best tools and you'll end up with pretty good food in the end. So freezer burn is not just on meat? It's not just on meat. Sometimes you'll see it on vegetables or fruit and it just looks really dried out. You know, freezers go through a freeze-thaw cycle. That's how appliances are built. And sometimes that can really dry foods out. But if there's a tear in a package or if you didn't close that container well enough and air gets inside of there, it's going to dry out the surface of whatever it is. It's probably most notable on meats because you see this brown, ugly, gray, dry patch on there. And it's just, it's edible, but it's not very tasty. <laughs> it can be really chewy. So it, you just want to cut that off and you can still use the rest of the meat. So using good packaging will help prevent that from happening. A couple of other options would be dehydrating and then freeze drying. Yes. Uh, dehydrating is popular to dehydrate fruits and vegetables. Um, a lot of people make jerky. So Again, on the fruits and vegetables, as I mentioned earlier with the freezing, those enzymes are at work still in those foods. So you also pre-treat fruits that could brown with the ascorbic acid or lemon juice to prevent the browning. Vegetables, they also need to be blanched. And it really does help a lot in this case because it helps the water get out of the food much more efficiently. A few years ago, I did an experiment with green beans to dehydrate them to see what the effect of blanching would do. One batch, I left them alone, didn't do anything to them, just put them in the dehydrator. Second batch, I blanched them as directed. Third batch, I essentially over-blanched them. So the ones that were blanched properly turned out perfect. They had beautiful color. They dried efficiently within the expected amount of time. The ones that I did not do anything to, even after 24 hours, they were still kind of squishy. They just were not getting dry very fast. And that's because those cell walls were just holding on to that water. It was not getting released. And the ones that I overcooked, they turned into brown little sticks. So they were awful. <laughs> so it, it proves the point that blanching really does make a difference. And just taking that time to do that step can really improve the quality of your food. Now, freeze drying is something that I've had some questions on. It is a process that's similar to dehydrating, but it uses freezing also at the same time. And it's done under a vacuum. The equipment that you need for this can be a little pricey. It's done a lot commercially to do freeze-dried foods, especially for like camping, because it makes it really lightweight. You look at a piece of broccoli that's fresh and one that's freeze-dried, and they're almost identical. It's really quite amazing. But it's done under pressure done under really cold temperatures, and it dehydrates the food. It takes the water out. I've had some questions about it. Some people want to try to get into it, which is great, but it's not for the everyday dehydrator. You know, it, it depends on how much you're going to use it and whether you get your return on your investment on the equipment. So that's something to keep in mind. Well, it's nice that there are a number of options because one of the things we want to do is make sure that all of this fresh fruit and vegetables is being used and not wasted. Absolutely. And that's one of the beauties of food preservation is it helps you to not throw things away that you could be using and you can save it for later use. And so the options are out there, whether you're doing canning or freezing or drying, to help save that food. And if you can't find a neighbor or a family member to give it away to, give it a try. And I think you could uh, have some really good treats in the dead of winter here if you start preserving now. And a lot of this information is available through one of the publications that you put together. Yeah, we have a lot of publications on food preservation in general. And all of those are located on my website. And it's the Rapid Response Center. And the website address is www.rrc.ksu.edu. And then you'll see right there on the homepage a link to the food preservation information. That's K-State Research and Extension food scientist Karen Blakesley, the coordinator of the university's Rapid Response Center. Again, more information is available at rrc.ksu.edu, rrc.ksu.edu. Sound Living is a weekly public affairs program produced by Research and Extension at Kansas State University. I'm Jeff Wickman.
And this is the K-State Radio Network.